coming fresh off of a six-figure tournament score, we're going back to the win, only this time for a high-stakes streamed cash game. Today we're playing 2550 with regular straddles. I get $25,000 in chips to start. This is my absolute favorite time of the year to be at the win with all the World Poker Tour events taking place. As I enter the ballroom, we see the stage where we'll be playing on the live stream, but the entire room is filled with players for the $1,100 Prime Championship with a $5 million guarantee. You can see how popular it is, and with several day one flights, it obliterates the guarantee, ultimately getting over $10 million in the prize pool. First place receives nearly $1.4 million. I make my way to the table. We'll be playing with a mix of talented pros and recreational players. It's a fun lineup. It's cool to meet a lot of people and play with them for the first time, but I also want to win. Here's a list of everyone who's playing and what we bought in for. Every player has between five and 10,000. I've got 10,000 in front of me initially with some reserve chips close by in case I need to add on. There are a handful of names that you guys may or may not recognize, but I'll give you a quick rundown of the opponents. Nate Silver is an extremely interesting guy. He's the founder of 538. He's a genius statistician, writer, and an accomplished poker player. Andrew Nimi is an up and coming vlogger who would probably have twice as many subscribers if he only incorporated a cat into more of his videos. Ben's Ben's is a popular Twitch streamer with thousands of followers. Abe Styles is an absolute tournament crusher and streamer who just joined the WPT Global team. By the way, sign up to WPT Global using bonus code BRAD for deposit match bonuses. It's home of the softest online games I've ever seen. I recently had one month in which I won over $30,000 playing cash games on the site. I have more information in the description box below. Conrad Simpson is a professional poker player who's been given a $5,000 free roll in tonight's game by Benz, but Conrad can only look at one card, which will make the day incredibly entertaining. Jamie Kerstetter is the person who organized today's game. She's an amazing commentator and perennial Twitter Personality of the Year award winner. Finally, we get to Vegas Matt, who's a slot content creator with a rapidly growing YouTube channel. Be sure to check it out once you get the chance. He's the least experienced player at the table, but he deserves a lot of credit for accepting the invitation and putting his money on the line. Early on in the session, with Abe Style straddling to 100, Conrad looks down at one of his cards and apparently likes it. He raises to 350. I assume the only card that Conrad saw was his king, making it the second best scenario for him. Benz is the person giving Conrad the $5,000 free roll of play looking at only one card. He's excited to get in the mix with some suited connectors as he calls. Abe Styles is aware that he's against a player who's playing partially blind, and he lays down the hammer as he three bets at 2,600. Conrad isn't giving up. Yeah, I'm oh my never. God. Oh, Look at this. Wow, here we go. Oh my goodness. Abe Styles putting out a huge raise. After Conrad opened a 350, Abe Styles decided to put all the money in with the pair of nines. Conrad snapped him off. <laughs> For 4,300 total, and unfortunately wow. his other card is a six, <laughs> so he will be three outing, oh, no. going to the flop up against Ape Styles nines. Wow, oh, that a uh, snap That's call! Nice, wow, nice. an ambitious so call, no doubt, Connie, but so tricky believe. to know how okay. you should approach these spots but when I'm you're only here. looking at one card. Sorry. I've never <laughs> spent any time considering oh, wait, how would I adjust I my play if I only knew one card. The players are running it twice. Conrad has almost a 30% chance of winning, which isn't terrible. It's too bad that they didn't decide to run it once because the flop comes king six deuce with two hearts. Conrad flops top two pair. It's a hilarious set of circumstances. Ape Styles has drawn slim on this board. The turn is the ace that doesn't make a difference. The river is another deuce. The player who can only look at one card has half the pot locked up, which everyone other than Ape Styles was hoping for. The second flop is queen 5-4 with two hearts. There's not much hope for Conrad, given that there aren't many kings left in the deck. He at least has some backdoor draws, but he doesn't want to have to rely on those. The card. King All right. on the turn! Oh, wow! <laughs> it just might be Conrad's day. Let's go! Oh, <laughs> you gotta root for it. Oh my goodness. <laughs> you have to root for it. Ape doesn't know what hit him. He's just like, how is this happening? The seven of clubs on the river marks the conclusion of the hand. Conrad wins a pot of over $9,000. It's one of the most ridiculous set of circumstances that I've seen in a hand for someone to get a double up and win thousands of dollars. With the straddle on to 100 again, Vegas Matt picks up pocket queens in the hijack. He assembles chips and raises to 250. Benz gets pretty out of line, deciding to make a call with 10-5 suited. 
The good news is that he'll have removal to all straight possibilities, but that's close to all that he has going for him at the moment. We wake up with two Broadway cards and we're in a nice colored shirt because my girlfriend told me I needed to mix it up and not always wear a hoodie and t-shirt. For the first time in a long time, I make a call from the big blind, not dressed as a 12 year old. Nate has some suited cards that he wants to play. He calls as well. We're going four ways to the flop from out of position. The dealer puts out Jack 10 six with two hearts. We've got an open ended straight draw, two overs and a backdoor flush draw. All things considered, it's pretty good for us. We've got the most equity, despite not having a pair. It checks to Vegas Matt, the pre-flop aggressor. He's feeling good with his over pair, and there's no reason not to be. He bets 550, which is about half a pot size bet. Benz didn't call a pre-flop raise to fold middle pair in a backdoor flush draw. He calls, I don't get the sense that Vegas Matt is bluffing, so I don't want to check raise as a semi-bluff, and I actually don't mind having multiple opponents in case I'm able to hit a straight just means that there are more people to possibly pay me off if say the nine of spades comes on the turn. I call, Nate folds immediately, it's down to the three of us, the turn is the nine of diamonds giving us the absolute nuts, it's a card that Matt might feel decent about too since he picks up the open ended straight draw but is drawing dead to a chop. I do a cool little check with my finger to hopefully induce a bet, Matt is in a rare situation in which he has the exact amount of chips in his stack as there is in the pot. He thinks it'd be neat to make sure that they're the same amount, and the best way to do that is by getting his chips in the middle to compare both amounts side by side. Well, and game over for Vegas Matt nice as melon, he jams <laughs> his queens on the oh turn gosh. for 2,700. I have the nuts. Brad Spicy. says, I have the nuts, <laughs> and snaps it off, so Vegas Matt looking for the three-outer to a chop on the river. No, the opponent's in rough shape. He reveals that he has the over pair, and he's in double-double toil and trouble. He wants to run it twice, I'm good with that. The first river is the six of hearts, which means I'll be getting at least 75% of the pot. If Matt's able to spike one of the three remaining kings, I wouldn't mind too much. He's a fun person to root for, especially since he's taken a shot in this game. The second river is the three of spades instead. We win both runouts to stack the opponent. It was a tough situation for him. I probably would have gotten stacked with queens there as well. We're off to a good start to be up several thousand early on though. Here I look down at ace-8 offsuit and the hijack. There's no straddle this hand. Ace-8 offsuit is a borderline holding that I could raise or fold. On stream, I tend to go with the more aggressive option to make things more entertaining for the viewers. I raise to 150. Vegas Matt rebought and he's doing pretty well on his second bullet. He three bets to 450 from the small blind with pocket tens. I like it. I would have gone for a slightly larger sizing, but overall, he does a nice job finding the re-raise. In a normal game, I'd snap fold ace-8 offsuit to a 3-bet. Our hand could be dominated and doesn't have great playability, but in this particular instance, we're facing a small raise size, and I like the idea of playing another pot against Matt in position. Worst case scenario, some money goes back to Matt after he lost a cooler to us earlier. Best case scenario, we win another big pot. I make the loose call for only 6 more big blinds. We're heads up, the flop comes, jack-8-3 rainbow, we both got second pair. The opponent puts out a C bet at 600. It's pretty rare that I'm folding flopped pairs when it's heads up, and I'm certainly not folding now. I call, but I'm in bad shape. The turn is the nine of spades. I don't anticipate it being good for the opponent after a three bet pre-flop. His range will do better on boards that have more Broadway cards out there. I definitely don't think that he's got that great of a hand once he checks. I doubt Matt has two pair or better. On a similar board, Matt jammed turn for a pot size bet with an over pair, so it's feeling to me like we're up against ace king or ace queen rather than top pair or an over pair. I bet 700 to take control of the pot and charge ace high type of hands. If the opponent calls, I'll check back nearly every river to ensure that we get to showdown relatively cheaply. The opponent calls, maybe he'll have a flush draw of some sort. The river is the queen of hearts completing the flush draw and putting four to the straight on board. Matt hits the back door straight, he's out of his seat excited. He's got all the tens and wants to make sure that I don't check back. He bets 1500. I'm done with the hand that I shouldn't have even gotten involved with in the first place. I fold quickly. Matt gets a good amount of money back. He's only in for 10,000, so he's not down much anymore after being in the hole early on. Matt shows half of his collection of tens. Then he shows me the second half of his collection before expressing some concern about the river card. Yeah, but I figured he would have a flush this, for so. sure. Nothing for I mean, him to worry about today. Two tens? Oh, no, you're the best hand. Very nice hand. Thank you. Makes your hand but even better. I should have bet less than you would have called. How does that work? 
I would have to win more. Um, you couldn't have bet any amount that I was going to call. Oh, really? You missed whatever you were looking for, or what happened? No, I just had a hand that got worse and worse. I see. <laughs> It's good to see Matt asking questions and trying to learn more about the game. I'm always happy to be honest with people about what I have, even if I'm slightly annoyed at myself for calling preflop three bets with bad hands. Vegas Matt does a good job making close to the maximum from me. Next we play a straddle pot with Ben's open limping from the button with the weak ace. Ape Styles is getting a discount in the small blind with a gapper. He calls for 75 more. I look down at Queen Jack offsuit in the big blind. I'm getting a discount as well. I call for 50 more. Nate Silver checks his option in the under the gun straddle as Frankie comes in to replace Conrad. Surprisingly, looking at only one card before getting into lots of all-in situations didn't work out well for Conrad in the long run. We're going four ways to the flop. The dealer puts out Jack-10 deuce with two hearts. We've got top pair and some backdoor draws. Ape Styles checks. I bet 300 for value and to narrow down the field. Under the gun folds. The button folds as well. Ape Styles isn't going anywhere. He calls to close the action. It's heads up. The turn is the deuce of diamonds pairing the board and putting another flush draw possibility out there. Ape Styles checks. I won't be betting almost any hands containing a deuce on the flop except pocket deuces or rare two pair combos. I don't want to risk getting blown off a top pair. I check to make sure that we can get to showdown. I've got intentions of calling a bet on the river almost no matter what. The dealer puts out the five of hearts. I don't love it because we don't beat a lot now that the deuce paired and the heart draw got there, but I already told you I was planning on calling a river bet almost no matter what. Ape Styles bets 450. My decision has already been made. I reach for chips and call, hoping that we're up against a busted straight draw. I'm surprised to see that instead, we beat top pair with the worst kicker. We have perhaps the most talented tournament streamer notched to win a medium sized pot and recover a little from the ace 8 hand. In this one, Vegas Matt picks up some cards he wants to play in middle position. He limps in for 50. In cash games, generally you don't want to limp in when you're first to enter the pot unless it folds to you in the small blind. We've got an opportunity to see a flop for half a big blind with jack three of hearts. I call. Nate isn't going to let anyone advance for 50. He needs to punish the limpers by raising to 250. Matt isn't too happy about it, but he didn't limp in to fold. He calls for 200 more. I'm closing the action and getting a good price with suited cards. I come along for the ride as well. We're going three ways to the flop from out of position. The dealer puts out 6-4 deuce rainbow. We've got a gutter and one over. No one really hits this very hard. I check. This is a board that shouldn't connect well with Nate after he raises from the big blind, but he gathers shifts and bets 250. Low pocket pairs and other combos containing small cards are typically going to be content seeing flops for free, so the fact that Nate raised preflop leads me to believe that at the very best, he's only going to have one pair. The opponent that I have to be most worried about is Matt after he limp called a raise, but as we see him react here, he doesn't appear to be all that strong before grabbing chips and making the call. Sure, he could be feigning weakness and might actually be really strong, but the way that I've seen him play other hands, I would have expected him to raise with two pair or better. His comment earlier about being worried that I might have rivered the flush when he made the straight with his pocket tens leads me to believe that he may suffer from monsters under the bed syndrome, which means that even if he does have a good pair in this particular instance, he might be someone who's prone to overfolding. I've got removal to the straight, and the way it was played preflop, it probably appears like I might have a hand containing low cards. My image is also pretty solid at the moment without having shown down any bluffs. When we put everything together, the fact that the preflop aggressor shouldn't have connected, the physical tells, the past history, the nut advantage that we have, the removal that we have, and my image, it's a good opportunity to make a move. I check raise to 1100. I'd prefer to have a backdoor heart draw to go with my straight draw, but there were enough other elements in this situation that favored us, I went for it anyway. Nate folds, Vegas Matt is also caught at the bottom of his range, he could already be drawing close to dead. He understandably folds. We get a nice play through with a decent amount of equity even if we had gotten called. This ends up being Vegas Matt's last hand because he has fake dinner plans. He did a great job of making a comeback, booking only a 2k loss which isn't much in a game with straddles to 100 and 200 regularly on. In this one, Ape Styles picks up a premium pocket pair in the cutoff, he raises to 150. When he raises from the cutoff, he's going to have a lot of offsuit hands that he really won't want to play from out of position if we 3 bet him. I re-raised to 450 to fold out some hands that are better than ours like weak offsuit aces all the way up to ace jack offsuit, then also king jack offsuit and other combinations that have a good amount of equity against us. 
With our 3-bet, we also take control of the pot in case the opponent has a low pocket pair that doesn't connect, then we can often win with a small c-bet even if we don't make a pair. Abe Styles isn't going anywhere, he calls to close the action. We're going heads up to the flop against the opponent, it comes King-10-3 Rainbow, it's a situation designed for me to lose all my chips and sanity, the cutoff checks. I'm trying to think about how I can get my stack into the middle, I'm loving life right now, but it all might be about to come crashing down as I bet 600. Ape Styles probably thinks that I have Ace King. He's contemplating whether or not to make his move now or wait to make it on a future street. If he check raises, I'll be losing a lot of cash. Ape elects the flat in order to set the trap. I put him on a high pocket pair, straight draws, and King Queen type of hands. The turn is the Queen of Hearts. I hate seeing it because a high percentage of hands that I put the cutoff on have improved to take the lead or will at least have a ton of outs against us. The opponent checks. Now that we've been downgraded to no longer having top two pair, coupled with the fact that we could be up against a straight, set, or better two pair, I don't want to inflate the pot. Getting check raised in this situation would make me want to throw up. I employ the same tactic that I did earlier against Ape Styles, as I check back turn with intentions of at least calling any reasonable river bet, regardless of what card comes out. The dealer puts out the nine of diamonds, that are four to the straight on board, it's very likely that we're up against a straight or set, but there's still some chance that we could be up against the worst two pair, like Queen-10, Queen-9, or 10-9. This I mean, was supposed to be Jack a catastrophe for Brad, and instead he's and gonna lose a little bit, but nothing serious. Ape Styles goes for his stack. I'm hoping it's not gonna be too expensive for me. I've got a baby on the way. The opponent bets 900. It's close to 40% of the pot. I checked for pot control on the turn. This is definitely an amount that I'm okay investing. I call. Sometimes with investments you lose, in this instance, I'm just surprised at the way I lose with the opponent finding the case 10. One. How do you have that? <laughs> you have that. Lost the minimum. He really did. He really did. A couple of things had to go right to not lose the whole stack. There was fortunately no check raise on the flop. Then the run out got worse and worse for King 10. I'm glad to still have the majority of my chips in front of me, but I still lost a good chunk. Not much goes my way for quite a while. I'm stuck a little when Benz gets tricky by limping in with pocket aces from under the gun. We pick up ace-queen suited in the hijack and raise the 200. It's a bad time for us to have a premium. Frankie gets caught in the middle with two Broadway cards. He calls, Benz bends, immediately limp three bets to 800-800. There's a common play with pocket aces so the alarm bells are ringing but We've already seen Ben's open limp, not so great hands previously, and we have an ace in our hand reducing the likelihood that we're up against aces by 50%. Perhaps Ben's is just making an unorthodox play with another holding. We'll be in position on the opponent with the possibility of making a powerful flush or Broadway. I call for 600 more. Frankie folds, it's heads up, the flop comes, king 6-6 six, six rainbow, we don't connect all that well except we have an over and some backdoor draws. The opponent bets a tiny amount of 400 into almost 1900. It's the perfect sizing given what I've got. I'm getting nearly 6 to 1 on a call, though I'm drawing very slim. I can't fold for that price. I call to see if we can improve on the turn. Otherwise, we'll be looking for the nearest exit. The dealer puts out the 10 of spades, giving us the royal flush draw. It's the best card that we could have gotten. Our equity goes from 5% to 25%, even though there's only one card to come. Plus, our opponent won't be folding an overpair if we're able to drill the river. Ben's checks. Part of me wants to check back and see the next card for free, but I also like the idea of taking control of the pot, maybe getting some of Ben's Ben's other combos that have equity to fold. Feels to me like the opponent might also have ace-queen after he checks the turn. I would have thought that he'd bet again with kings, ace-king, and aces, so I mostly ruled those hands out. I'm going for the semi-bluff. I was gonna say, yeah, half pot feels right. And that's Although exactly it is a paired, it is a we get a snap call from the opponent after betting a healthy amount. Usually, when opponents have really strong hands, they take some time to at least contemplate check raising. So even though we could be behind, I get the sense that our draws are live, and the jack of spades will obviously give us the nuts. One time, the river is the four of diamonds. It's a complete brick. We end with nothing. The only way that we can get the win is if we fire big as a bluff we decide we want to go that route. There's no real opportunity. The opponent leads for 1500. I'm definitely not going to turn our hand into a bluff at this point. I show the table that I missed the royal flush draws, I fold. It's another situation in which it's tough for me to not lose a lot of money given how it was played and the run out. 
Ben shows, only the Ace of Hearts as he drags in a pot of almost $7,000. I'm left wondering if he had a pair, or if maybe I got bluffed. But either way, I'm stuck 3500 after being up a few thousand earlier on. It'll be a long session though, with plenty of opportunities to win big pots, I promise. Despite being down, I'm comfortable in this lineup and I like playing deeper. I had 5,000 to my stack. I'm in for 15,000 total on the session. Jason Somerville takes a seat to sub in for Vegas Matt. Jason had a massive influence on me. He's actually the first poker content creator that I watched and rooted for. He's the founder of the Run It Up series, which was always focused on players having as much fun as possible while everyone competes for big amounts of money. I'm excited to play against Jason because it's not often that we're at the same table. My very good friend, business partner, and really the creator of the modern poker vlog, Andrew Nimi, raises to 150 from the hijack. It's our turn for pocket tens. We're in the small blind. Remember I pointed out earlier that I liked it when Vegas Matt three bet from the small blind with tens, but I would have preferred a larger sizing. I three bet to my preferred sizing of 600. It's three times the initial preflop raise, plus a little extra for having to play from out of position the remainder of the hand. Andrew has the type of hand that I'd hope and expect for him to fold since it's not suited. Instead, he calls for 450 more. We're heads up against the person in the poker industry who's probably improved my life the most. The flop comes Queen Jack 10 Rainbow. We've got bottom set on a very coordinated board. Even with the set, the way that this has been played pre-flop, we could certainly be up against better sets or a multitude of straight combinations including Ace-King Offsuit and Ace-King Suited. This board isn't going to get better for us. Even if a Queen or Jack comes out, we could end up being against a better full house or quads. Still, we need to try to set up the pot for an all-in at some point down the road if we get a clean run out. I bet 800. Andrew has a big piece of the flop. If he had a set, I imagine that he'd put in a raise to protect his equity before the board gets any scarier for either of us. Andrew just calls, which he might do with Ace-King, but that's been discounted and I'm more confident that our bottom set is best. The turn is the four of clubs, which I love seeing. I'm still trying to set this up for an all-in. I stick with around a two-thirds pot sizing at 2,000. If Andrew calls, we'll have about two-thirds of a pot size bet remaining in the stack. Andrew's facing a difficult decision. He has removal to the nuts, a set of queens, and an overpair. Plus, he has top pair with an open ender. Surely he'd jam with a straighter set at this point. Instead, he just calls, so now I'm almost certain that we've got the best hand. We just need another blank card. The river is the six of clubs. It's a phenomenal run out for us. We've executed this to perfection so far with our bet sizes to line up a river shove. I rip it for 46.25 into 68.50. It's about as close to two thirds of a pot size bet as it gets. Andrew's getting two and a half to one on a call and isn't sure whether or not his top pair is best. He's understandably taking his time. The board hasn't changed much from the flop to the river. So if he thought he was best at that point, he's likely gonna think he's still best. I'm representing straights, sets, or potentially two pair. If I don't have those hard to make hands, I'm bluffing, and king queen will be good. If Andrew calls, this will be a pot of over $16,000. It'd be by far the largest pot that we've ever played against each other. Andrew likes the price that he's getting at least enough to make the crying call. I'm happy to win a massive pot, but I'd rather it be against someone that I'm not as close of friends with. Andrew pulls out a 5k flag to pay for the all-in call in order to buy back in while keeping his smaller denomination chips in front of him. With this win, all of a sudden we're back to being up about 4,000 on the session. Later on, we're up 5,000 when we look at ace-4 suited under the gun. It's a fun hand to play. I raised to 150. Andrew needs to get revenge. He calls on the button. Benz is looking to get involved. He calls as well. The action's on Ape Styles, who tends to be pretty aggressive. He's already put in lots of 3-bet squeezes. He goes for it once again with a 3-bet to 750. It's another sort of small sizing, but I like the hand that he chose to do it with because it can clear out a lot of equity from combos containing two overs. Folding ace-4 suited is reasonable, but it's a hand that I like to play similar to aces due to the removal and the playability post-flop. I 4-bet to 2,000 to potentially win this immediately or to minimally clear out some of the junk hands from the opponents in between me and ape. Andrew and Ben's fold. The big blind and I started the hand with about 400 big blinds each, so Abe calls knowing that we both have plenty behind. We're heads up with 4,300 in the middle already. This is a big pot. The flop comes ace, queen, deuce with two diamonds. We've got top pair, but we're not sure if it's best in a four bet pot. The opponent checks. He could have queens, ace, queen, or a better ace. I can have all those combinations in my range also though. I put out a small bet of 1,300. 
which is less than one-third the pot, to retain control and charge all the opponent's hands worse than top pair. 8 makes the quick fold knowing that it was a great flop from my range, even if I was 4-bet bluffing pre-flop. At the moment, I'm the second biggest winner in the game with over 7,000 in profit, Nate Silver is crushing it with almost 25,000 in profit. It's a fun lineup, it gets even more interesting with Rampage joining us. Here we pick up 7-6 suited in the hijack, the straddle 200's on, I raise a 250. Today's big winner so far, Nate Silver, picks up some Broadway cards, he could call or 3-bet, he goes with the 3-bet to 750. It's a good play because it makes it tougher players on the button and in the blinds to get involved even if they have better hands like ace highs, and we actually see a few aces get thrown into the muck. Our suited connector hand should be in a lane of its own, meaning if we flop a strong hand like a straight, trips, or two pair, we're not going to have to worry much about the opponent having anything stronger than us. We're also playing ridiculously deep, so if we can hit something big in an unexpected way, we could win a $45,000 pot. I call for 500 more, hoping for a low flop. We're heads up out of position. The dealer puts out queen 4 3 with two spades. We have a gutter, but there's a flush draw on the board for a suit that we don't have. I check. The opponent has top pair with a strong kicker. He down bets to 500. This is a great situation for us if we can drill a 5 because the opponent has a good enough hand to possibly pay off a large wager. This may be surprising for some, but we're never supposed to fold our gutter on this board, even with the flush draw out there. We're supposed to either call or somewhat frequently check raise as a semi bluff. If we get re raised, we'll have an easy decision to fold knowing that we only have three clean outs. I call 500 to see the turn. It's the four of clubs. The turn's disappointing because we no longer have a draw to the nuts. I check. Nate wants to make sure that he can get to showdown without getting blown off of his hand. He checks back a combo that's theoretically supposed to be a bet. The reverse, the six of spades. The front door flush draw gets there and we improve the second pair. After seeing Nate check back, our pair of sixes might be the best hand if we're up against any number of high card combinations. I make a small bet of 400 to try to get the showdown cheaply rather than check and feel inclined to call a big bet in instances like this one when the opponent has a better pair. Right away, Nate grabs a sack of black chips and snap raises to 1600. It's odd to me that he wasn't strong enough to bet on the turn, but is now confident enough in his hand to raise. Pretty regularly, this is a bluff because my $400 bet on the river looks weak and it'll often induce aggression from hands that can't win at showdown. I wouldn't expect the opponent to raise on the river with a hand like pocket 8s, 9s, 10s, or jacks, which is kind of how he's played this so far, and he's supposed to be betting hands like king, queen, kings, and aces on the turn, so it seems to me he's repping a flush or nothing, and even a lot of his flush draws would have continued betting on the turn, so this whole line looks suspect. I call it a bluff catch. My assessment of the situation is incorrect. Nate wrecks me with his sneaky check back on the turn and does a great job to get me to pay him off on the river because I wasn't expecting to see or get raised by a pair of queens. I lose a good chunk of our profit. We're joined by the legend Vince Van Patten after Ape Styles heads out. Vince was a professional tennis player at one point in his life and is still an actor and WPT commentator. He's one of my favorite people in the industry. The graphics are a little off here since Vince only has 3,000 to start the hand instead of 5,000. He raises to 300 with a decent pocket pair. We're next to act with Ace Queen Offsuit, even though there are some issues with the RFID readers. This isn't a hand that we want to go multi way to a flop with. I 3 bet to 1,000 to make sure that no hooligans get involved for a cheap price. This is only Vince's second hand in, but he's ready to gamble. He 4 bet rips it for 3,000. I don't like it, but I have too much invested to fold where I'm getting 2-1 to one on a call. I toss in some calling chips. I let Vince know that he's probably in the lead because I expect to be up against either ace-king or a strong pocket pair. Vince lets me know that he has pocket nines. I tell him it's basically a flip, but he has a slight advantage in this situation. The pot is actually $6,000. If we win, we'll be back up close to the high point. If we lose, we'll only be up 1000 on the session. The flop comes 883 with two spades. It's not good for us since we don't make a pair and only have two more chances at it. The turn is the five of hearts. We're down to one final card. The river is the 10 of hearts, giving Vince the full double up right as he joins the stream. That's a significant pot to see go the other way, but couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. I'm not feeling very optimistic since the momentum is definitely no longer on my side after losing a few key hands. The session's coming to an end when we all decide to play a bomb pot we each put in $100 pre-flop and go straight to a flop. The flop comes 7-6 deuce rainbow. We've got 8-6 offsuit, good for middle pair and a backdoor straight draw. Rampage bets a tiny amount of 75 with 10-5 offsuit. 
There are too many players with hands to go through all of them, but everyone has enough of a piece to call the small bet. All eight of us see the turn. The five of spades comes out to give us an open-ended straight draw. Checks to Rampage again, who turned third pair. He bets 50 because he realizes that 75 was probably way too much. Four players call. None of them should have anything very strong once they only call ridiculously tiny bets twice and have tons of opponents. We've got removal of straights, set, and two pair combos, a raise to 800 to represent the straight that we don't have. We get a good portion of the table to fold before Jason Somerville calls with his two pair. He's probably not even feeling that confident with that hand at the moment. Andrew folds his pair in open ender. Benz has a flush draw and gutter that he calls with. Vince isn't in the gambling mood with his over pair and open ender. He folds. A raise narrows it down to just two other opponents. If we don't hit and non-spade comes out, I'm likely going to bomb the river. The dealer puts out the three of clubs, putting four to the straight on board. Jason checks. Benz knows that he can't win a showdown with his pair of threes. He represents the straight with a bet of 2100. It seems incredibly suspect. I'm not buying it, but it's not just Benz that I have to worry about. I also have to worry about Jason having a straight behind me. If I make the call or raise, it'll almost definitely allow us to win a huge pod given what the opponents have, but it's too big of a risk in this situation. I fold rather than continue repping 9-8. Jason suspects that the bet could be a last ditch effort to steal the pot from Benz as well. Ultimately, Jason makes the hero call. Benz reveals that he was bluffing with only fourth pair. Jason was the late addition to the stream, but he ran well and played great to win some huge pots against some of the other opponents at the table. He ends up being the second biggest winner as the stream comes to a close. Two players win over $20,000. No one lost too badly who are still at the table, although the people who started out the stream with us who left early took some hefty blows. But it was an entertaining session, battling with some of the most interesting and talented people in poker. It's time to rack up. Played for six hours. I lost 1750, but in a big, big game like that, that is pretty much breaking even. So it uh, doesn't really matter too much, but awesome lineup. Just some of my favorite people to play with, including Jason Somerville and Vince Van Patten. So just really, really cool to play with them, especially a uh, really up and down session for me. I think I was up. 4k or so right away then i was stuck like 5k then i was up 7k and then uh ended up you know not really making any hands at the end there that's it for this one guys i hope you enjoyed it if you did i'd appreciate it if you hit the like and subscribe buttons helps out the channel a ton if you have any questions or comments feel free to let me know in the comment section i'm happy to get back to you don't forget to sign up to WPT Global using the bonus code BRAD. That'll get you a deposit match bonus of up to $1,200 and more. There's additional information in the description box below, but definitely take advantage of that. And then there are a few other things that WPT Global is doing in the future to benefit you guys. Uh, I'll have more information on that in a future vlog. But um, there's gonna be uh, several WPT World Championship videos that I still need to work on and that I'll be releasing in the upcoming weeks that cover some awesome tournament runs that uh, are, are just going to be really cool. So be on the lookout for those. Next week, I might take a little break and do something extra special for a vlog though. So uh, yeah, that'll be, that'll be pretty sweet. Um, hope you guys are all doing well. Hope you're staying safe. Good luck at the tables and go Niners.